Hi friends, I thought I might start out today by saying that it's been a really busy day, but then I thought to myself, you know what, I think I'm a little bit tired of using the word busy because I think it kind it's one of those words that over time has developed into a slightly different meaning and these days it feels a little bit like it has a negative meaning. So I decided to look up the word busy. I mean, we all know what busy means, but it's always interesting to look up what the dictionary says about it. And so the dictionary says busy, having a great deal to do. And the example sentence that they give is he had been too busy to enjoy himself. How negative is that? That's implying that busyness is you just overloaded with work stuff, whatever it is you have to do, tasks. So instead of saying that I've had a very busy day, I'm going to say that I've had a very productive day. How different does that sound? Then it feels like something really positive. Productive implies that I've achieved things that I've wanted to achieve. I've been able to cross things off my list and I've kind of done it all on my terms. I just find it really interesting the way words, the use of words change over time. And I think it's important to, to be concise with words and um, to really convey meaning. But also if you do have a lot of things to do or you've been doing a lot of things, to turn it around and make it feel positive rather than overwhelming. So in today's video, you're going to be seeing a little bit of what I've been up to in this productive day. It's hard for me to present a typical day because I don't feel like there's necessarily a really typical day because every, every day things happen, things change, and I'm never really quite sure what I'm gonna be doing from day to day. But I guess this is me, you could say, in my ideal sort of day where I'm choosing what I want to do and choosing what I want to do, by the way, doesn't have to be a selfish thing. It can be that I'm choosing to serve my family in certain ways and that makes me feel good. And it also fulfills my purpose, what I think my purpose is. But then I'm also making time for other things, for personal exploration and enjoyment. So today we're going to be looking at a little bit of crochet, a little bit of baking, a little bit of weaving and a little bit of homesteading. And I'm really enjoying making these videos where I can film myself doing the things that I was going to be doing anyway and sharing a little bit more of my, what I hope is a fairly simple life or at least trying to be a simple life with all of you. And that you can all learn a little bit or be inspired or whatever it is by what I'm doing and sharing with you. Crochet is one of those things that I've always found super difficult to do. It's just like my brain and crochet just don't click somehow. And it's not through lack of trying that I haven't been able to really go ahead with crochet. I got the very basics down, you know, how to make a chain and how to um, crochet like a very basic border. And I used crochet in my last class, my table mats and trivet class. And that really helped me, but I've never really been able to go forward with it and make a project. So lately I've been really feeling like crocheting because as I've explained in previous videos, I'm trying to do things that are relaxing in the evenings where I can sit with my family in the lounge room and be present with them all, but have my hands busy because somehow I just need to have my hands busy. So I started mucking around with the crochet hook the other night and my daughter Gemma, who's really, really good at crochet, she's one of those people who uh, with certain things, she barely even needs to learn them. I joke that it's a little bit like Neo in the Matrix where he just um, gets a download or an upload and then, ah, oh, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> it's similar with her. It, she just, I don't know, she, she clicks with a lot of things. Anyway, she's really good at crochet. And so she's been helping me to understand a little bit more of why I wasn't able to go forward with it. And I think one of the major problems is, well, I've known this for a while, but one of the major problems is that um, is stitch placement. Where does my hook go next? That has been one of my major issues. And one of those things where people, other people just seem to be able to get it and I just cannot 
get that. I even went to a crochet class once, many years ago now, um, and it was kind of, I felt humiliated because other people in the class, it was like they'd all done it before. I don't know whether they had or not. Uh, I think some of them were total newbies. But they just picked it up and they, they just went ahead with it and they all made a granny square. And by the end of the class, an hour and a half or two hours or whatever it was, um, even with the help of the teacher, I still didn't have a completed granny square. And I couldn't for the life of me crochet a granny square at the moment. I just don't have that knowledge or understanding. And so, yeah, I just felt really left behind. Anyway, so Gemma has been helping me and what I've started doing is a dishcloth because that's something small and perhaps more achievable. And I'm just doing like a very basic single crochet depending on where you're from. The terminology is different, but I'm finding it really achievable at the moment because I'm just repeating the same thing over and over. And she Gemma watched me for the first couple of rows and now I'm doing it by myself, which is really great. So I'm just going to show you in case you're interested in crochet, in knowing the very basics, I'm going to show you um, just a really quick overview of what I'm actually doing. So I'm using a, what size hook is this? It's a 4.25 millimeter, um, which says, I think that says six. Yeah, I think that says six on there. And I'm using um, the same cotton that I used in my last video to do my knitted dish cloths. So it's the Yarn and Colors Epic Cotton. And this is where I've got to so far. So it's definitely not perfect. I've got, you'll notice that it's a little bit ripply and that's probably because I've accidentally added a stitch here and there that wasn't supposed to be there. But you know, it's this is the first time that I've gotten this far with anything crochet, like as far as um, a larger piece. So this is the start of my dishcloth and I'm, it's going pretty well. So some of the key things to note that helped me to understand this better is um, previously I would have been looking at my work flat. So you're working row to row and turning it around as you go. That was another difficulty for me. But I was thinking all the time of holding my work flat and then to find the next place to put my hook in, um, I'd be going in somewhere in the front here or whatever. And that was confusing to me because I couldn't recognize, well, what's a, what exactly is a stitch? But when you turn it on edge and you've been um, stitching away, then you can see these V's or little heart shapes and that you can see that those are a stitch. And so when I want to go into the next stitch, I need to go into one of those V's. I'm going to go into this one. And when I go into the V, I'm going underneath both of the, I guess, the legs of the V. Then I'm grabbing my yarn and pulling it through so that I've got two stitches on the hook. And then I'm yarning over and pulling that yarn through both stitches. So now when I look at my row on edge again, I can see that the next V occurs here that hasn't been stitched into already. And so, and also my daughter told me, which was super helpful, that if you turn it slightly on its side, once you have recognized the V from the top, turn it on its side, there's a little hole at the bottom of the V and that's where the hook goes. So there's um, just a natural hole there that is like room for the hook. So I went through and then I yarn over and through and then I look to the next V with no stitches in it yet and then I'll go underneath that one. So this is how I've been able to do this much of this crochet cloth already um, and it's going pretty well. It's as I said it's not perfect but and I'm very very slow like compared to someone who's been doing this for a while I'm super mega slow but that's okay. I'm good with that. And I haven't really perfected the art of pulling the loops through or pulling the yarn over through the loops without actually holding onto those loops. I find that that 
often gives me really tight stitches and then it's hard to get the hook through the next time. Um, but like most things, I'm sure I will develop techniques to deal with that as I go along. And so my aim at this point, haha, I have many aims, and <laughs> many goals, but I would love to do a crochet blanket. I would love that. Um, not sure what size, probably like a, oh, dare I say a single bed size, or is that just overkill? Maybe a lap blanket first and then see how I feel after the lap blanket, whether I would want to ever crochet a blanket again. Yeah, we'll see. So anyway, I really only learned this stitch. I, I've seen the other stitches. I'm aware of them. I've even worked some of them at different times. But now that I understand what I'm doing a little bit more, then I might expand into more stitches. But for now, I'm happy to just keep repeating this and get myself really familiar with actually crocheting. And this cotton, this is so lovely. I did talk about it in my last video, but I'll leave the link for it down below again, in case anyone's interested in giving it a try. It's really good. It would be lovely for woven cloths as well. So that's my crochet and um, as you can see, the edge is not too bad and I'm very happy that I am crocheting and I'll continue to work on this. And then once I'm finished this, I'll decide whether I'm going to venture into the world of blankets for crochet or not.
I just started warping up for this sampler and I found that there's a knot in my warp yarn about halfway through the warp. It is just a sampler and yes, I could have just let it go, but I thought seeing as I was filming this for you, come on Kel, don't be lazy, show everyone what to do when you get a knot. So my knot is just here. Uh, I'm just gonna lift off my yarn from the peg and take it back to the apron rod at the back. Just pull that through so you don't get a great big tangle. And I'm only pulling that one loop off. So I know that that piece right there is not gonna work for me with the knot in the middle. So all I have to do is cut it, leave a little bit so that I can tie it. And I'll just tie that onto the apron rod as though I'm just starting over. And then I'm gonna locate the knot exactly. So it's right there. Cut it off so that the piece with the knot is discarded. I'll use that as a tie or something. I use all my scraps for scrap yarn for all different purposes. And then I can just put that back on, retie it onto the apron rod. And then I can keep going as though nothing happened. It can be a bit frustrating if you get a ball of yarn that has a ton of knots. And usually it doesn't happen because usually yarn companies are pretty good about that sort of thing. They know that it's not desirable to have knots in a continuous ball. But sometimes you'll get a bad batch and it'll happen. So in that case, you just have to keep cutting back to where the knot was and then retying and going on that way. Also, if you get a ball that has a ton of knots in it, it's good to let the company know or the seller or whoever's responsible for the yarn, just to let them know not to be nasty, but just um, in a friendly way, just say, hey, just wanted to let you know that this particular ball that I bought had a lot of knots, whereas it hasn't had before, if that's the case. And um, they can take note of that and try to improve on that. to set myself a challenge and I definitely succeeded in that because this is challenging. This is Crackle Weave on a samplet loom and a couple of reasons why I chose to do Crackle Weave um, and a couple of reasons why I chose to use the samplet. So one of the reasons I wanted to use this 10 inch samplet is um, I hadn't used it before with multiple heddles. As I mentioned in my last video, I got some new lovely heddles from Tracy at Knit Spin Weave and now I am utilizing them. So I've got three heddles in here 
and you would have seen a little bit of me setting this up warping it up um, it was a challenge even to just do the threading but I did figure it out and one of the biggest challenges probably was just the lack of space behind the second heddle so the second heddle the two heddle block is on here it's built into the sample loom when you buy the loom um, but on an, a regular rigid heddle loom say on my 24 inch when I have two heddles on the double heddle block there's a ton of space behind those two heddles to the back beam heaps of space but on the samplet it's really actually quite challenging to get an extra heddle in there I really did want to use the three heddles though because I didn't feel like rigging up a heddle rod so I'm using the three heddles and a pickup stick now for this crackle weave it's a four shaft threading but then it's um, a six treadle treadling and this is because you need to use tabby so think of the yellow here as the pattern picks and think of the dark blue weft that is also the same as the warp as the tabby or the plain weave so for every pattern pick that has to be followed with a plain weave and the plain weave when you're using multiple heddles like this you can't just use um, heddle up or heddle down for plain weave because there's a lot more going on so you need to use multiple shafts to obtain your plain weave as well so my plain weave is on one side it's shafts one and three on the other side it's shafts two and four and every pattern pick is followed by a tabby weave and you can see the tabby building up in all of these kind of blue areas uh, and that helps to build it up and make these wonderful shapes now if you are interested in crackle weave it also has an older name which I'm not going to try to pronounce it starts with J and um, I'm not sure how it's pronounced but if you're interested I'm actually using the green book of Marguerite Davison because I'm lucky enough to have that book but I've also got the orange book and you know there are often differences between the green and the orange book well I'm happy to say that the crackle weave patterns the drafts that are available in the green book they're all in the orange book as well so if you have this book or you're interested in it you can find the crackle weave patterns in there I'll link to this book down below so just to give you an idea of um, how I can start building these shapes and how it all works uh, it's just going to be a brief overview it's not a tutorial by any stretch of the imagination but I've done my last tabby pick there and now I need shafts one and two one of the one of the difficulties is um, even just getting that second heddle up and into place because the third heddle as I said there's really not much room for it to go back and forth there so I take my pattern weft and take that through beat and then I need to follow up with a tabby my tabby's on the left so I'm going to do a one and three tabby so I've got heddle one this is my heddle three or shaft three and then I take the tabby through and to build up the blocks of pattern there are a lot of repeated pattern wefts so I just did one and two and I'm going to do that again and I do it for a total of six times and that's how I get to build up the columns to make the patterns so now I need to do tabby on this side as well I'm going to do two and four tabby okay so back to one and two for the pattern weft and then my tabby so once you've got the loom all set up it is pretty plain sailing but you need to concentrate um, because there's a bit going on the repetitions are good 
because you can do the same thing over and over and you get to know it pretty quickly just by repeating the same actions. But yeah, there's a lot going on with a lot of different shafts. Um, but it does make this really awesome pattern. And there are variations on this as well. So I could do the um, heddles in different combinations to get different. Whoops, what did I do? Um, see, this is exactly what I was talking about. I think that I've, yeah, I know what I did. I did a tabby instead of shafts one and two for my pattern weft. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Now you can believe me that it takes a bit of concentration. And I'm not using floating salvages just because I couldn't be bothered putting them on. So I'm doing my edges manually. Okay, um, tabby. So um, I've thought about the possibility of doing a class on this. I'm not saying that I will at this point, but I will consider it. But if I was going to do a class on this, at this point I would be doing, I would be doing the three heddles. Um, and I know that every time I do a class a certain way, I have, a a trillion different people asking me to do it a different way like with heddle rods whatever but I would be doing it just with the three heddles because I think that this kind of weave works best and is most efficient that way and I would also probably be doing it on my sample loom just so that people with smaller looms can have a go at something more intricate and it would also not be a project class. It would just be a sample class. Just what I'm doing here, a sample, not a finished project. Um, and that is just to be kinder to myself at this point. Anyway, if that sounds good to you, let me know in the comments. As I said, I'm not promising anything. I'm just saying maybe. So that's six repeats of my pattern weft there. And you can see how that has built up the sort of top of this, what would you call that? A kind of diamond formation, sort of. Um, and that's built that up. And so then I go on to a different combination of shafts. I uh, go on to two and three instead for the next part. So two and three. And then follow up with my tabby. And then I repeat that for six times as well. So I'll continue on with this and then I'll, I'll come back to show you a little bit more of the pattern because it does take a little while to just work that up. But I'll come back and show you how it's looking. Mm -hmm. 